Hello, everybody. I'm Shinobi from Bitcoin Magazine, uh, sitting down with Shores Provost, Provost. Uh, Hello from there. Bitcoin Core. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about kind of the internal organization and workflow of Bitcoin Core. Um, hopefully leaving everybody at the end of it with a little bit of an understanding of how developers approach their work and um, maybe, just maybe, uh, a little bit of understanding that they are not a homogenous group that all have the same opinions about everything. <laughs> oh, they certainly don't have the same opinions. <clears throat> I think five minutes on GitHub would convince you of that. So, um, yeah, you, you, you've been contributing to Bitcoin as far back as I can remember. I think the entire time I've been in this space. Uh, Bitcoin Core specifically in the middle of 2017, I, I made my first contribution. I was playing with uh, Paul Storz's Drive Chains project. Oh no. Trying to see if it, <laughs> if it was actually running code. And then I ran into error messages that were nonsensical. And I tried to improve some of the Bitcoin tests, Bitcoin Core tests to give better uh, error messages. And I think those were merged within a year or so. Mm -hmm. Break my but, but once, you, once you, you enter that rabbit hole, it's... There's no way out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, what, what's it like contributing to Core? Like just from a, you know, a personal perspective? It varies. I mean, sometimes it can be a little frustrating, but also it's very interesting. You, I found it nice to meet some really smart people, um, you know, because most of these people, most people are doing it for, not for the money. They're doing it because they find the project interesting or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. you just meet a lot of uh yeah, very smart people with good ideas. <clears throat> and some of the sub-projects you could almost say are super interesting. Uh, there's also just very boring plumbing stuff that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very underappreciated <laughs> from just your average user's point of view. Yeah, but of course, you know, not everybody is doing the boring plumbing stuff either. I guess I, I'm still somewhat lucky. Uh, I'm just a reviewer. I'm not a maintainer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't, don't sell yourself short. That's that's important too. No, but the, the, the thing is, if you're the maintainer and the release is broken, like people are going to complain <laughs> and you, know, you can't ignore the problem. Whereas okay, if you're so just a developer, you're like, well, I'm just going to review things that, I'm, that are interesting. So I don't care about all these problems. Let other people deal with the bugs. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you know, so, I, I'm not saying I'm doing that, but uh, like, not my fault. <laughs> but some, somebody gets all the complaints or, or at least, you know, can't, you know, doesn't want to ship broken code. So there, there is some, un, I think, especially maintainers have to do some of the more ungrateful work of like somebody has to make the backports mm -hmm. and actually ship them. And somebody has to, you know, when, when there's an actual bug in the release, can't just ignore it. And then they'll have to cajole other developers to to be interested in, in looking at it. Because mm -hmm. ultimately nobody's in charge, so there's no CEO that says like, you guys get in a room and fix these 15 bugs before you go home. Yep. People can just decide to not fix any bugs. Yeah, it's kind, yeah. kind of a thankless job, you know, especially um, since Vladimir and some others have kind of stepped down and we've seen mm -hmm. new maintainers take those roles. It's a lot of animosity, frankly, just from the average user base in terms of demands made on maintainers or criticisms of how they handled an issue that's not really taking into consideration like that free-formed organizational aspect of core where it's there are no bosses like you can't tell anybody to do anything you can either yeah do and something especially not the maintainers like the, you know you can't tell the maintainers to just implement feature x or, or merge software why mm -hmm. uh, because the maintainers you know when they see a pull request that says you know double the coin supply let's pick something uh, the maintainers may have an opinion about that but from their role as a maintainer they need to sort of see what what other developers think of it and, mm -hmm. and so they need to wait for somebody else to review it they can't just merge something because they like it or they don't like it yeah they're, they're... it's <laughs> supposed to be somewhat janitorial now of course you know things are always more nuanced than that mm -hmm. but you know, ideally a pull request appears on GitHub because somebody opens it and the maintainer sees it and says, okay, that's just a pull request, but it hasn't had any review, so they just ignore it. And then at some point, you know, it's got a few acts on it. And then a maintainer might see, okay, I see an act, so acknowledge, like, good. And then, okay, there's three of them. But then the second question is, okay, who are those three acts? Are those people who actually know what they're talking about? Or there's just drive-by comments because mm -hmm. you don't want to, you know, it's not that that drive-by review is bad; it's useful, 
but there's, you know, you want to make sure that the code has been looked at by people who actually understand it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the number. And then hopefully, you know, there's two, maybe one or two experienced reviewers and a few others that have acted. And then the maintainer just says, okay, that meets the, the bar for quality and just hits the merge button. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the next pull request and that's all. And I think that's also usually how it goes. Uh, this is just a few exceptions where there's a bunch of drama on it, especially if somebody wants to get something in mm -hmm. and then start promoting it on Twitter, then you've got 50,000 acts of, by people who have never seen a line of code, probably haven't actually run it. Can't even read a line of code. And then you've got one neck, as in not acknowledged, like bad. Mm -hmm. And if that one neck comes from somebody who does understand the code, then that might get a lot of weight. Because mm -hmm. the other aspect is, yeah, you, you, you only want to merge stuff that has gotten positive review and then does not have any objections. Mm -hmm. So would you, you, would you say it's fair to kind of characterize like their role and their job as kind of a responsibility to sideline their own opinions or attitudes and chiefly weigh and concern themselves with others? Like, is that I, I don't know if it's be... that noble. I, I think there's often the case where if, if a pull request is, is within the expertise of a maintainer, then that maintainer might review it and then merge it. Okay. So their opinion does then matter, mm -hmm. right? Well then to say, I guess, maybe like a, a chief aspect of, mm -hmm. of their job is to consider and weigh other people's opinions and not simply react based on their own. Yeah, they also have to consider other people's opinion. I guess that's a better way to put it. So they might have expertise in the area and they might themselves think it's fine. And in that sense, they're just another reviewer. Uh, but then they also have to put up, I guess, their more neutral maintainer hat and say, okay, if I'm the only one who looked at this, then maybe, you know, other people should have looked at it as well. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't go as far as that they're like Supreme Court justices that are like completely neutral on, on everything. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I guess um, the, you, you want to kind of like walk us through abstractly, like the life cycle of a, a pull request on Quark? Like yeah, I, think, I think the example I just used, right? So it just appears because somebody's opened it. What happens is if, if, let's say if I open a pull request, well, I need people to review it. And there's, again, there's no CEO that says you shall review this pull request. Mm -hmm. So it might, maybe nobody reviews it. But usually what happens is when a pull request is new, it sort of shows up on the first page of the GitHub list and there's some notifications going into the IRC channel, like, hey, sure, so open the pull request. So usually in the first couple of hours after you open something, you'll get a bunch of people's first impressions on it. Uh, and then the art is to kind of keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if the pull request fixes something that other reviewers really care about, then they'll most likely review it. Mm -hmm. And so you'll get feedback and the feedback might be, okay, just a few details like, hey, you know, you're not using indentation here or this function name is wrong or, you know, maybe add a test here or there. Mm -hmm. um, or it can be more fundamental. It's like, no, this approach is completely wrong or you're solving the wrong problem. And then you as the author of the pull request then have to deal with all that feedback, either by fixing what they say you should fix or by explaining that they're, they're asking for the wrong thing or sometimes even saying, okay, this is reasonable, but it can wait for a follow-up. So I'm not gonna fix it here. Mm -hmm. So you've made those changes, then people will come back and review it again. And that could go on for a few rounds. And what can happen is it can sort of start stalling where you've got the first review, you fix the things, but then the reviewers just disappear for months at a time because they're doing other things. Or as a reviewer, you've, you've done all the review on the pull request and the person who wrote it disappears for three months and doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So things can get a little stuck. And because, you know, people get notifications for new pull requests. So, so a pull request can get completely forgotten almost and can be quite frustrating, especially if you're the author of it. It, it has this... Um, Rebase hell, I guess is a term for it. Mm -hmm. But the, the main or the master branch of Bitcoin Core keeps changing. And so you may suddenly have to update your pull request to account for all the other changes that people have been making from under you. And you can be stuck in that situation for a while. Mm -hmm. So then it can be helpful to try and find reviewers more actively. Maybe, you know, if you know who else worked on this area of the code, you can ping them to some, from one channel or the other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just give up on it, I guess. That's another option. Not a good one, though. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, some, or sometimes you decide it's the wrong approach. Yeah, Yeah. well, I mean, that, that I'd say isn't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's smartening up. 
Yeah, but it is a tricky part to divide attention because, again, there is no project manager or boss of Bitcoin Core. So you can have 300 pull requests open. And you kind of want to, I kind of like to imagine pull requests as rooms in a giant office building. So you get one of these nice modernist buildings with big amounts of concrete and small windows. And, and if you walk through the hallways, there's not cubicles, there's like actual offices. Somebody can be in one of those offices for years and nobody ever talks to them. Uh, because you don't see each other, you don't see through the walls, it's all uh, siloed. Mm -hmm. So, and this creates a problem where, yeah, some of these offices are super crowded and there's like 20 people in it chatting about, but then other offices are completely abandoned. And you, you can kind of ping people to, to make them come to your office and, and take a look, and they might, and they, they might disappear again, and you're again alone in your little office for another year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it, it, it kind of sounds like, you know, th this dynamic isn't purely like a, a resource issue i mean like you know obviously if there were more developers with time like this would alleviate maybe or you just end up with even more pull requests and more distraction because mm -hmm. you need enough reviewers i think the bottleneck tends to be review so there's just more pull requests and there's people willing to review it mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so more developers could just mean more pull requests which would mean less review per pull request which would be bad yeah uh, I think there's other dynamics. It's, I mean, I, I even slightly blame GitHub because they have this notification system that sort of draws your attention to the thing that changed most recently. Mm -hmm. Whereas really, ideally, you should have your own list of projects in a separate system and decide what you want to work on, not based on what is pinging you all the time. And this can create a, um, a, a compounding effect where the pull requests that are active, they trigger the most notifications. And so that's where you're going to spend your attention on. Mm -hmm. Whereas the pull requests that are just sitting quietly in a corner and not changing, they don't notify you, so they get forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there's a dynamic that's not just about the number of developers, but it's really about the, the way people work. And again, nobody in charge to, to change that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an incentive issue yeah. at the end of the day. There's no, not even any politics involved, right? This isn't like nobody likes your software. This is just mm -hmm. you've made a change that some people find interesting, but they, they're, you're in this room and they haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, everybody only has so much time. And when you're mm -hmm. self-organizing, like you, you can't put yourself two places at once. Yeah, and not everybody has the same way of self-organizing either. Some people might be super structured and getting things done and all these fancy meth methodologies, GTD. Mm -hmm. uh, and others might just only look at GitHub notifications and only re respond to those as they come in. And still others will have another system you know I, I think something you know m m maybe not um entirely created for this reason but something um core has been doing to kind of address this type of problem is like the working groups for different sub projects mm -hmm. and kind of trying to get groups of developers um focused on like a specific area or yep. like end goal um do you, you want to talk a little bit about like how that came to be and you know, whether you see that kind of making a difference, at least when somebody can get a working group together, like progress with what they're working on versus... I guess the, it's the just general. another way to get people to pay attention to a subset of the pull requests out there. So you basically a working group is could be a group of people that are focused on a specific feature that they want, say silent payments or something else, mm -hmm. or the kernel. And then those people might be in a signal group together or an IRC group together, it depends on how they want to work. Then there might be somebody saying, hey, we've got you know 10 pull requests and somebody should look at number nine again. So uh, yeah, it's, it's another way to coordinate the work. And, and some people like to do that in a more closed setting because they feel more comfortable about that. I mean, the, 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 the actual code is on GitHub, but the, the just nagging each other, like who should work on what might be happening in a more private chat. Mm -hmm. Or they might even meet physically, which is always a good way to get stuff done. But if the working group itself, you know, d doesn't have to work, you could, you, your signal group could just go dead <laughs> or everybody's just waiting on this one person to do something and that person doesn't do it. So it's not a, it's not a silver bullet either. Mm -hmm. But it, it could make sense. And I guess, you know, where, where do you see in, in the longer term, like core going in terms of how it organizes itself? I don't think much is going to change. I think the main thing that will hopefully change is that core will be a more narrowly focused thing. So there might be separate projects because I, I do think it's a problem now that 
pick on core is just too many things. I like, think a like lot the, of people... like the wallet versus the the consensus logic versus the the databases and the, just the different the RPCs pieces. and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. But then it sounds nice in theory. But then if you think about how to actually split it and if that actually works, I'm not sure either. But uh, I think the way people work together in an open source project is kind of like a company culture. Mm -hmm. It just tends to stay pretty static. People have their own workflows and they'll change a little bit over time, but there's no you know, big intervention manager out there that could change the culture. So I don't expect much to change. And I guess, you know, to kind of wrap everything up, what, what do you think people outside of core could kind of do to help alleviate some of the, the tension and slow pace of things besides review more pull requests? <laughs> oh, I was going to say review more pull requests. <laughs> I mean, in general, the whole world should not be entitled, right? There, there is this thing where people might think, oh, Bitcoin Core is this organization like this company or like the government that should just do things for me. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if you're not happy with what Bitcoin Core is doing, you should do it yourself or you should set up, you know, fund an organization that does these things for you. You don't have to write code yourself. You can set up a you know, the equivalent of open sets that has a goal to make an alternative for Bitcoin Core. Uh, maybe Bitcoin Core would even welcome some competition to, to get some focus. Mm -hmm. Complaining that people are not doing the thing that you want them to do is uh, just, just a lot of negative energy. Mm -hmm. Then again, you know, it's a free world. You can do it. Yeah, it's, you know, like I've said, whenever this topic comes up, like the people doing that, they're not paying any developer's salary. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah if you're using something that other people made for you and you're not paying for it, then you don't really get to demand anything. Yeah, I mean, it's people People need to think about how to support developers rather than just demand things from them. Yeah, and I don't know if the answer is trivial. I mean, like I said, review can help, but also just testing can help. Mm -hmm. And filing good, filing good bug reports can help. But, you know, there's other issues that are much more difficult to solve that you, you just can't unless you're involved with it. Mm -hmm. Well, start contributing to Bitcoin Core. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, thanks for right. sitting down and talking, Shores. Thank you.